Thank you very much for coming. Um, I just want to say I'm absolutely thrilled to be interviewing Mary. She's uh, one of the hottest designers in the world right now. She's also trained in England and is considered, uh, her show is one of the hottest tickets in Fashion Week. And she's really on a roll and it gives me so much pleasure to be interviewing with her today. Um, before she comes on stage, we're just going to watch a little bit about her show from the Autumn Winter 2013 collection. So if we watch that now, and then we'll bring her on stage. What, what are they doing that's different from everybody else? What is the training like there? Why is it, why has it produced so many incredible designers? I think for me, it's part of Louise's uh, educational ways is that they're not the norm. She doesn't believe in education as education is, is, is kind of taught. She feels that, you know, people or students who've been in education since elementary school, high right. school, uni, um, have almost been institutionalized. So it's almost about trying to take them out of their ways and have they've, they've been educated and give them a, an independence of thought and reason. Um, and you're able to talk about your work, define your work, research your work. And I think it's that. Okay. You know, she has an incredible eye. So when you present her with something great, she'll be able to focus on that and lead you towards that. But more than anything, um, she'll help you stand as a creative um, and form your own ideas and work on your own ideas and explore that. And I think that's very different. You know, there aren't modules, there aren't set classes, there aren't set things to teach. Right. It's just her curating a fashion show out of however many students she has each season, but with an impeccable eye. And she's so witty. She's, she's so brilliant. witty, she's yeah. really uh, funny, and she's extremely intelligent. So, you know, that combined with somebody who's really ambitious and driven and wants to work hard and wants to succeed, it's a good match. And also, obviously, the best want to go to Central St. Martin, so they pull from the best. Right. And then there's Louise. So I think that combination, I think, has led to so many designers coming out of Central St. Martin's and doing so well. Long may it continue. Now, I just wanted, so you did your BA at St. Martin's and then you did your MA at St. Martin's. Yes, I'm, I, I'm a St. Martin's baby through and through. Great, great. And your graduation show was a big launch pad for you. Yes. Did Bill Blast buy your whole collection? Bill Blast actually bought uh, a collection that I was doing while still in the MA, which oh, was wow. an interiors project. Um, and I met this guy who used to work at Bill Blast, who, his name... Um, escapes me right now, but as an interior designer, and he saw my designs um, when he was visiting, and he absolutely loved them, and he bought the entire collection that was never shown, never presented. I didn't even see it ever come out of Bill Blast, so God knows where that's gone. Amazing. But, <laughs> but they loved it, and so it was a big honor for me to have that happen at that stage. Great. Okay, so that gave you the confidence. And then you began, which I've heard you speak about in, in uh, before, in uh, what you called Fashion Jail, your Hackney, Fashion Jail. East Hackney studio. Yes, it was Hackney Wick. It wasn't even Hackney okay. per se. It was beyond Hackney. Um, and it was a little place that we found as soon as I graduated. Um, I already had um, submitted many applications to Fashion East, New Generation, um, to get the support financially right. to show um, and to um, hopefully uh, start up a collection immediately. Yeah. So we found this space, me um, and another girl from there made that we finished together. It was at this old, um, I think it was a peanut factory. Oh, that's what they called it, um, in Hackney Wick. And it was a tiny room, probably um, as big as this stage. Mm -hmm. um, it had cement on the floor, mud coming through, um, bars that look into, you know, the... Um, the streets, but because there were uh, there was always a car parked right there, you couldn't even see the light beyond it. It was literally the bars of the car, and that was it. And that's why we called it Fashion Jail. But that's where I did my first collection from. Actually, two two collections. I did hear you say that during that time you were working so hard that you went to bed in the bubble wrap. Yeah, that continued well beyond Hackney Wick. Right, I was going to say, <laughs> are you still sleeping in bubble wrap? Because um, I, or is there I'm not as creative now. There's, there's a sofa that is used, <laughs> so no need for bubble wrap. But um, at that stage, you didn't expect. I'd heard that designers sleep in their studios and it gets really late and you don't have time to go home. And I was like, surely it can't be that bad. I mean, obviously, there will be half an hour to go home and shower, but it, there isn't. At, th at that stage, you're so involved in the collection and the build-up. Um, you need to start so early, you finish so late. Um, that it just makes sense at that stage to remain within the studio. So that's why sometimes I was sleeping uh, beneath the table and people didn't know I was sleeping there. So I woke up and all the embroidery people just freaked because I was um, 
well, I was resurfacing from the ground. <laughs> um, it's it's not as bad anymore. You know, we still stay really late, um, but it doesn't feel as dire as it was. But it is really stressful, and yeah. I think you're so involved in the collection that you almost don't want to miss a moment. So you you just feel a lot more, um, I guess, um, at ease by being there, knowing if anything goes wrong, somebody can grab you. And your company has grown at extra in an extraordinary pace. I'm sure some of your peers from St. Martin's will be looking at you and won't have grown quite so fast. Is that, would you regard yourself as much a designer as a businesswoman? Do you think that the I two think, are essential I think there's now? a bit of both. I remember when I graduated, my parents saying, you need to take a business course. You have no idea about business. Um, I also never had the ambition earlier on in life to have my own business, so I very naively went into it. But I think you learn a lot, and because it's your own business and you're so invested in it, um, I really like learning about how to uh, create a cash flow. I really like doing my P&L. I really liked understanding the legal, um, I mean, the most basic agreements that you were taking. I didn't have the, the funds to seek legal advice, so I kind of had to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you feel a lot more confident when you gain um, a level of knowledge that can allow you to understand your business inside and out, the commercial side, the, the financial side, and obviously the creative side. So I think I didn't know I had it in me, but there were times where I, I enjoyed doing that more than actually creating. So I think it fluctuates. You can't feel creative every single day of the year. And so when I'm not on a creative tangent, I know that there's other things um, that are part of the business that you need to strategically um, and brainstorm on or think about or even financially set certain goals. So um, I think it, I'm a bit of both. And because I started selling really early on, I, I had to understand the commercial validity of the product really early on because I started at a time of recession. So everything um, had to almost um, be built and be established in a very short period of time. And people were taking a, a big risk on a young designer. So you almost had to prove yourself. And, and thankfully it happened. Who was your first stockist to take you on? And which show, that was after your MA or during your MA you got a stockist? Um, it was after my MA. I had been approached by Browns in London to buy the collection, but my MA collection, I could never take it into production, so I couldn't. So the very first store that actually placed an order is an Italian store called Penelope in Brescia. And um, I remember telling her, you were my first ever store. And she's like... Uh, funny you say that. Um, I've been the first store for another designer, and that is Alaya. So okay. I was like, okay, I'm Fine. in great hands then. If you have great. Alaya and me, yeah. then it's a great start. Okay. Um, and she was the very first one to actually place an order. And now you're stocked around the world. I mean, your, your stockist list is, is beyond. You're with Netaporte around the world yes. in terms of e-commerce, but there's also indep independent stores that stock you. Yeah. We have um, about 260 stores right now right. across uh, 47 countries. And I think that's when you really understand that your business has grown into a global business. I think you start traveling, you see the customer who buys your clothes. It's very different, you know, the woman buying you from Australia to the woman who's buying you from Canada to the woman buy, buying you um, in Europe. It's just a completely different customer. Mm -hmm. So it, by traveling and... Um, almost forming those relationships with these shops, you understand a lot better your market. And I think that's where we are now, mm -hmm. that I have a much better understanding of the woman wearing it. And the woman is a lot more diverse in terms of age range, body shape, profession, than I ever thought. Um, because you so are really one exciting of the, to see that. You're one of the only women today who is designing for women. I mean, there's very few women out there. I think there's more and more now. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Um, I think, you know, um, women, like any other profession, they're coming into their own and they're taking a lot more ownership and fashion should be a business that is dominated by women. And, and it is to a certain extent because all the, the, the craft that goes into it, there's so many women who work as machinists, as an embroiderer, as a pattern cutter, as in anything in your business. Um, and I'd say within the company, um, probably we have an even split. I think it's important to have an even split because mm. a woman um, within fashion and her organizational skills and her multitasking is really, really valid, um, as well as a man and, you know, the, the flair that you get and the, vi the vision they have of a woman and what they'll offer to a collection is completely different. Mm -hmm. So I feel it's important to have both. But I think there's more, more and more women designers out there um, starting their own businesses from Stella to Phoebe mm. to... 
Um, de- yes, to, exactly. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's yes. it's it's still male dominated, but I think there's more and more women coming into their own. Sarah Burton at McQueen now. Yes, quite a few. Well, let's take a little look at you at work. We've got a yes. little video coming up, VT. If we can show that, and we'll watch Mary at work in her studio. Yes. That was great. Looking at that, I just want to talk a little bit about your uh, how you use technology in your work because yeah. it's really, really strong. And you're a pioneer in that whole way. And to me, you're a technical wizard, but you still manage to keep something very feminine in your work. Is, that, is this something that comes really naturally to you? Are you obsessed with technology or is it... I don't think I was ever really obsessed with technology. I think I was taught in the most traditional way to use screen printing and a flocking and all the traditional ways of printing. And I was very frustrated at that time that I couldn't uh, realize the vision that I had and the ideas that I had in my head through that process. Mm -hmm. So I kind of self-taught myself Photoshop and uh, I just used that as a tool. Um, as any um, artist would use their paintbrush, I was using my mouse as a tool. So though digital printing had a whole revolution around it, attached um, to the most part, I think, back to London, um, I still never used it in terms of its filters or it, in terms of all the advances that Photoshop as a program allows you to have. I always used it as in the most traditional sense, which is um, the fact that you can uh, print um, that gradation of color and that level and depth of color on a printed fabric. So it's more the method of printing than the actual tools I used in terms of the advances of technology. And um, of course, there's, that's an advance in itself. Um, but I think it allowed us to create our own fabrics. We weave our own brocades and we can overprint on them. You'd never be able to do that previously through digital printing. Um, with screen printing, you do have certain limitations that have been lifted. Right. So I think it just allows more designers to find their own signature and be able to create their own path. And um, maybe 10 years ago, print was only something decorative that was um, a, a floral motif or you know um, an abstract block of color, whereas now you can create a story through your clothes. And I think that's probably what people connect back to my work, that every look tells a story. It's a thematic collection. Sometimes the theme is very literal. Sometimes the theme is abstracted. Um, this season we worked on shoes, but um, it was very literal at the beginning of the collection just to send the message that we're doing a masculine shoe, it's a brogue. But then as the collection progressed, you saw some of the details in the sneakers of the sports shoe. And by the end section, which it was the evening slipper, it was only the, the beautiful embroideries um, oversized. So I think um, designers can use now digital printing and all the technology to their advantage to just create a very signature uh, style a lot earlier on in the career. So, you know, you can define a lot more through a print than you would 20 years ago. And, and I think that's the strength um, and the power of the digital revolution that happened within that, that it can be as definitive as a cut or a drape. It could uh, make a woman feel special enough even if her uh, dress is very simple. Um, it gives out a way and it communicates a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you really mix print with shape and yeah. form is for you when you did your lampshade collection for example that yeah. was a whole new wave of shape and form everybody was completely taken by surprise um yeah i mean we we within the team were taken back by surprise as well because up until then my work was only um about print printed most of the work the silhouette was secondary to the print it just right. worked around it to enhance the print but that um collection because it was built and you know within my digital collage you could see the lampshade silhouette come through i just looked at it and i thought it's very similar to to a skirt anyway the only thing that's different is the actual construction of it obviously you need the crin and the wire and the the morphing of the silhouette but beyond that it's still a really cute um, extended tulip. <laughs> um, and so um, we really worked on the construction to make it feel um, as real as possible. So it kind of doesn't cross the boundary between it being something novel and something gimmicky. Right. And I think that season we got it right. And it was the beginning of me starting to really work with form. Um, and not necessarily only uh, down low, but up above, we started doing blazers and tailoring and a lot of outerwear. And um, a lot of the placement of the prints became more um, harmonious with the silhouette. So we started working on both. Now, when 
we build a collection. There's the silhouette and there's the print, and right. they we kind of work with them together until you have something that shows off a great synergy between. And I think it it's is incredibly complex. It's and very yet, technically yes. uh, complicated, but I think people now see my work as shape and print, right. whereas before they might have thought it's just about print. So I think now they do see it as form and print coming together. And I hope um, you know all the developments we're doing with um, within textiles and the innovation within textiles in terms of our embroideries, in terms of the embossing we do, in terms of our weaving, the weaving of our own brocades, only works to complete that world. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's far beyond um, print. It's just that I'm usually inspired by uh, an image. So it's image-led. Right. And for your inspiration, are you literally opening a, a book one day and go, oh, film noir? I love it. <laughs> or typewriters, that's amazing. Scrap metal. <laughs> um, uh, interiors. I, it depends. Or, or have you got little ideas in the back of your mind that you've, that you've loved all your life and you're kind of... No, I haven't loved them all my life. I think it's, it's a little bit... Um, I, I want it to be something that's a little bit in sync with um, our times and also with, you know, where your head is at every season. So the season that it was film noir and a man-made view on nature, it was the fact that I wanted to strip away the color from my work. Right. And I wanted to strip it away from something as graphic and as limiting as what the stamps had been before. Because within the uh, postage stamps and the banknotes, you almost have the frame of the print that you need to work around. So by doing a landscape and uh, a black and white landscape, um, I felt we were free to explore different silhouettes, different shapes, different textiles, because you're not limited by the form of the print. It's an endless landscape, and you just frame it where you want to frame it. So um, I think it was kind of um, a vehicle for where I wanted my work to go in a reaction against uh, everyone thinking that a print needs to be bold in color. Um, and I felt you could do beautiful prints that aren't necessarily as colorful. Um, but other seasons have been more of a continuation. You know, the Blown Glass collection that was one of my very first ones was a yeah. continuation of the perfume bottle collection. Right. So I had done perfume bottles, and then while researching that, I'd seen the work of Peter Layton, who's a Blown Glass artist, and that one led into the other. So sometimes it leads on, sometimes you feel you need to change something in your work, sometimes you feel you need to make a statement about who you are and then take it back the next season. I think it's an evolution and I don't think you can react to a collection before a certain time has passed because it's all part of, um, I guess, uh, hopefully a, a, long, um, a long process and a long um, evolution of your work. A long evolution for sure. I, <laughs> I, I can guarantee you that will be. We're going to open up now for some questions with the audience and... Um, if anyone has any questions for Mary, please ask away. Hi, Mary. Um, Hi. What advice would you give to a current fashion um, student? In general? <laughs> yeah, in general. Um, I think um, in terms of having your own business, or are you thinking of working for a different fashion house? or You're doing your MA. Well, You're doing your MA, okay. I think... Um, when I was in my MA, the best advice I got given, and that probably at that stage didn't seem helpful at all, is to stay really close with the people you're doing your MA with. Because when you go out into the world and you get jobs or you start up your own business, that will be your community. You will be the people forming and influencing other designers' works, other fashion houses' work. Um, and it's somebody to bounce off ideas and it's somebody to give you advice at that stage. Um, and it's something really important to have that I didn't uh, so much give that much importance at that stage because you're so focused into your work and um, your own ambition that it's very difficult to keep those relationships. So that would be one and something that will probably seem more useful now because this is just a general thing which is very useful, um, I think is to remain very, very focused. That this is the time that you have now, I think, to find what your own identity is, and that can continue evolving. But I think it's, it's the time that you'll have the most time to explore your work. So I would say to, to take as much time as you can to really push your work and take it to a level that you feel it can generate more and more ideas. And be prepared to sleep in bubble wrap for a few nights. Yes, it that might happen. Somewhere. It might happen. <laughs> it's not forever. We have a lady at the back, just there, please. Thank you. 
Well, first, thank you for sharing so many things with us because it's very interesting to see the person behind <laughs> the design talent. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to know, go, taking it further a step from the MA, if someone is already trying to establish a business, what would you think is the milestones, let's say? Because as you said, you were picked up early, your collection, and you were in one or two shops. And, yeah. But what is the big jump that happens that made you to arrive to a certain volume, as not even the volume you have now, but when did the big jump um, happen? I, I think certainly having uh, a really strong core of shops buying into you, so meaning um, stores who are influencers worldwide is very important because if you have certain stores, for example, when I was first bought, uh, bought when uh, Bias first bought my work, I had stores like Colette, like Browns, like Corso Como, uh, stores that really influence other shops. So I'd say a big milestone is to get um, those five to ten shops that really influence all the other shops. Um, looking into your work because it goes by word of mouth. People go to these shops to be inspired for what they're going to buy into their shop. So I think that's definitely a milestone. Um, a second milestone for me um, at that stage was um, winning the Swiss Textiles Award. That was really early on into my career. It came just after the Lampshade Collection and it gave me the financial support to be able to build a team that before that was only uh, based on interns. So I think a second milestone is to be able to build your own team, whether that comes from external fun funding or from the money you, you've gained from your sales on a wholesale level. Um, and I think the third milestone w within that is um, having a continuity as a designer and um, evolving enough to gain um, respect, not only from your customers, but also from the press um, and from your buyers. Um, and it's, it starts then to become more of a global business. Your work is recognized beyond the platform you're showing. For me, it was London Fashion Week for anyone. It could be anything. So I think, not that it's a milestone, but there comes a point that you feel this is a lot more international now. You travel, you see women who travel buying your clothes, uh, you see uh, your work in different publications, and then you know you have the image. And when you have the image, then it's about really um, almost protecting that image, but allowing it to grow. Um, I wouldn't say that's necessarily a milestone, but I think you kind of reach that stage when you feel, okay, this is now me. Now, where can I take this? Where can I go? Um, and how can I do it in a way that remains relevant, but also is um, fulfilling the needs of your market? On that, I'd just like to ask, how, for you, how important is press coverage? Because not everybody gets it. Mm -hmm. And now, with the internet these days and social media, a lot of people can become their own publicists and promote themselves like they never could before. Yeah. You're very active on Instagram, Twitter, yes. etc. You have thousands of followers on Twitter, <laughs> um, quite rightly. For you, how important is it to promote yourself through those channels, but also to get press coverage in, in the publications? Is it still crucial I think, for someone? Or um, for me, it was um, a strange... Um, it was, it was strange because my work was so bold and so distinctive that at the beginning when I started, I had no press. I was gaining more and more shops, more and more people were buying my clothes, but no one wanted to shoot the dresses because they didn't know how to style them, how to combine them. They didn't work within their story. You had to either let it live on a page okay. on its own or not have it at all. And of course, I'm a tiny business. They're not going to give me an entire page. So I was lucky if I got a mention as a young upcoming designer, a little feature, but there wasn't strong editorial. So oh. I, I thought that's going to remain with me forever. I was like, I don't understand. All these shops are buying the clothes, but why is there no press? Um, especially because most of my contemporaries were getting loads of press, but not the sales I was getting. So I, I just felt it was a, a, a very strange um, imbalance. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, as you, as my work evolved, as I became a little bit more established, people started shooting it, giving it more time to, to live on its pages. You started seeing it um, in a more creative way, broken up, not broken up. Um, and I think it, it started becoming, um, or, or hopefully leading a trend of its own. So by right. the time it started leading a trend of its own, because when I started, it was all about minimalism, and I was trying to define um, 
what I'm suggesting, by the time what I was suggesting became a trend, um, you started living in all these pages and getting more press. And at that stage, as I said, you have an image that you just need to curate. So I think as a young business, me being able to be active on Twitter, on Instagram, um, just allows you to put that message across the way you want people to see that message. And I think it's a very powerful tool to have if you know how to use it and what message you want to put across. Um, especially right. because we don't advertise. So that's the way uh, you advertise, that's the way you connect to your customer, that's the way you get their feedback. Um, I think different social media have different applications, but specifically Twitter keeps you on track. And even within your industry, it keeps those, those connections and you get an instant reaction from your customer, which is great. And on Instagram, completely different. As a creative, I want to take pictures when I'm traveling and put them out there. I want to be able to share those with people who are interested. So again, it's not necessarily just promoting your work, but it's definitely about defining who you are as a whole, as a brand, as a designer. It definitely gives you that freedom and platform to do that. So if you use it well, especially as a young designer, I think it could be very, very um, significant. Okay, thank you, thank you. I think we have to wrap up quite soon. Okay. It's gone really, really fast. Do we have time for one more question? The gentleman over there. Sorry, I should have allowed more time for Q&A. Uh, the gentleman just over here, if we could. Hi, Mary. Hi. Um, for your Spring Summer 14 collection, you dissect your collection into three, each representing prints of different types of shoes. How did you come up? How did the idea come about? And was this a business de decision over creative decision? A business of our creative. Um, I think it was a natural decision because we uh, had started working with Gianvito Rossi on doing our shoes. So I was in the mood for shoes, looking at different brogues, looking at the evening slipper, looking at trainers, and it just made sense for me to take something um, and not have it be about the shoe at all. I think the collection, even though it was themed on shoes, it was more about the woman who wears these shoes. So how does a woman wearing a brogue differ from a woman in her sneakers, from a woman in an evening slipper? And try to connect that back to the collection and the silhouettes and um, also try different techniques. So I think it just made sense. It's the first time we do shoes. It gives you uh, the platform to look at different silhouettes and different techniques. Um, and it also brings it back to something that I think um, is very uh, me in a way and very recognized for being um, my work. So I think that was the general idea Great. behind it. Okay, we've we got time for one more. Um, <laughs> there we are. Please, gentleman at the back with the microphone, if you can just get that to him. Thank you. Hi, Mary. Hi. Um, I should probably take this opportunity to uh, say you, you are my Photoshop hero. <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> that's one. That's one thing I haven't um, been called yet yeah. on, the, on, the, on style.com. You touched on this briefly. What I'd quite like to know is, I'm sure there's no typical, but in terms of the source of your inspiration, so the medium. I mean, obviously there must be something, as you said, probably deep in your psyche from a kid, you know, something like that. But the actual mediums that you use, do you typically? typically browns books, dare I say, do you use Google Images? Do you, you know, w w what's the tip um, or the main medium that you use? Or just taking photos when you're out and about looking, you know, around nature, that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm not usually out and about looking at nature, not much time for that. So She's in the <laughs> I'm going to negate that one. Um, no, it's, it's a little bit of everything, but the process of, uh, process of researching a theme is usually continuous and it runs throughout the season. So there's a point that I may have seen something in a book that will make me go on, uh, on my computer and research that. But is that. Is that Google Images? Um, verbal research first. So by verbal researching, I Wikipedia. learn more about my subject matter. When I learn more about my subject matter, I go into Google Images. On Google Images, I'll have a huge set of uh, images to use that then get filed depending on how they relate to the collection. And then um, beyond that, we work on um, imagery that it's either inspired by an image I saw or it's a collage of images that are found that then create something that's um, very artificial in its nature, uh, depends on, th on the theme and on the season. Sometimes we'll have um, that theme and we'll go into the library and look at references just on that because it's quite limited on the internet how you'll really search into something into depth. Sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. But um, 
there's a lot of internet research. There's a lot of research that still happens on my computer just because there's instant access and I'm constantly um, on it. But beyond that, it usually doesn't start from the computer. Usually it's something I've seen or when I'm traveling or on a book or mostly through a conversation. When I talk to somebody creative, it usually sparks off an idea. Um, and usually I'm like, oh, I haven't done that. I've never researched that. And then it will lead into the whole exploratory stage. OK. Okay. Thank you. That's, That's great. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to read you one quote which I got from Tim Blanks, who's one of your biggest supporters, fashion critic with Style.com and a lot of other publications, who for me is one of the most respected fashion critics in the world and one of the nicest men. Absolutely. And I asked him just to say a little bit about you. And I'll just read out what he said and then we're going to end and then we're just going to leave you with a video of Mary's recent show for Spring Summer 14, which she just had two days ago. Yes. It was fantastic, extremely well received. <laughs> Amazing reviews, and uh, it's going to be a very, very successful co collection commercially, and I'm already thinking of ordering everything. So I'll just read what Tim said. One word that crops up often in fashion talk is dream. Mary's work is one time when it's relevant. You know how you see impossible things in dreams? Mary makes the impossible happen every time. Her clothes are as wondrous and disturbing as the best dream you ever had. So I'll leave you on that. Thank you very much, Mary Katransu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Such an honor. Thank you. Absolutely. We're going to leave now. Here. We're going to leave now, and we're going to leave you with a video of the show if you'd like to stay and watch that. Thank you all very much for coming. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.